the Bible, and the Catechism, in a year. Day 1 From the Book of Genesis Six Days of Creation and the Sabbath In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness He called night. And there was evening and there was morning, one day. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and separated the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And there was evening and there was morning, a second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind, upon the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, a third day. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night, He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, a fourth day. And God said, Let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the firmament of the heavens. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarm, according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, a fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the cattle according to their kinds, and everything that creeps upon the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and of everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, a sixth day. From the Book of Psalms Book 1 The Two Ways Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, 
but are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. From the Gospel of Matthew The Genealogy of Jesus the Messiah The Book of the Genealogy of Jesus Christ, the Son of David, the Son of Abraham Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab the father of Nishon, and Nishon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam the father of Abiah, and Abiah the father of Asa, and Asa the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat the father of Uram, and Uram the father of Uziah, and Uziah the father of Jotham, and Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh the father of Amos, and Amos the father of Josiah, and Josiah the father of Yohanyah and his brothers, at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation to Babylon, Yohanyah was the father of Shealtiel, and Shealtiel the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abiat, and Abiat the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim the father of Azor, and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Ahim, and Ahim the father of Eliud, and Eliud the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Mathan, and Mathan the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David were fourteen generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon fourteen generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ fourteen generations. Apostolic Letter Litamor Magno Peire, in which the Latin typical edition of the Catechism of the Catholic Church is approved and promulgated. John Paul, Bishop Servant of the Servants of God For Everlasting Memory To my Venerable Brother Cardinals, Patriarchs, Archbishops, Bishops, Priests, Deacons and to other members of the people of God. It is a cause for great joy that the Latin typical edition of the Catechism of the Catholic Church is being published. It is approved and promulgated by me in this apostolic letter and thus becomes the definitive text of the aforementioned Catechism. This is occurring about five years after the Apostolic Constitution Fidei Depositum of October 11, 1992, which, on the 30th anniversary of the opening of the Second Vatican Council, accompanied the publication of the first, French-language text of the Catechism. We have all been able to note with pleasure the broad positive reception and wide dissemination of the Catechism in these years, especially in the particular churches, which have had it translated into their respective languages, thus making it as accessible as possible to the various linguistic communities of the world. This fact confirms how fitting was the request submitted to me in 1985 by the Extraordinary Assembly of the Synod of Bishops that a Catechism or Compendium of all Catholic doctrine regarding faith and morals be composed. Drawn up by the Special Commission of Cardinals and Bishops established in 1986, the Catechism was approved and promulgated by me in the aforementioned Apostolic Constitution, which today retains all its validity and timeliness, and finds its definitive achievement in this Latin typical edition. This edition was prepared by an interdicasterial commission which I appointed for this purpose in 1993. Presided over by Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, this commission worked diligently to fulfill the mandate it received. It devoted particular attention to a study of the many suggested changes to the contents of the text, which in these years had come from around the world and from various parts of the ecclesial community. In this regard one can certainly understand that such a remarkable number of suggested improvements shows the extraordinary interest that the Catechism has raised throughout the world, 
even among non-Christians, and confirms its purpose of being presented as a full, complete exposition of Catholic doctrine, enabling everyone to know what the Church professes, celebrates, lives, and prays in her daily life. At the same time, it draws attention to the eager desire of all to make their contribution so that the Christian faith, whose essential and necessary elements are summarized in the Catechism, can be presented to the people of our day in the most suitable way possible. Furthermore, this collaboration of the various members of the Church will once again achieve what I wrote in the Apostolic Constitution Fidei Depositum. The harmony of so many voices truly expresses what could be called the symphony of the faith. For these reasons too, the Commission seriously considered the suggestions offered, carefully examined them at various levels and submitted its conclusions for my approval. These conclusions, insofar as they allow for a better expression of the Catechism's contents regarding the deposit of the Catholic faith, or enable certain truths of this faith to be formulated in a way more suited to the requirements of contemporary catechetical instruction, have been approved by me and thus have been incorporated into this Latin typical edition. Therefore, it faithfully repeats the doctrinal content which I officially presented to the Church and to the world in December 1992. With today's promulgation of the Latin typical edition, therefore, the task of composing the Catechism, begun in 1986, is brought to a close and the desire of the aforementioned extraordinary synod of bishops is happily fulfilled. The Church now has at her disposal this new, authoritative exposition of the one and perennial apostolic faith, and it will serve as a valid and legitimate instrument for ecclesial communion and as a sure norm for teaching the faith, as well as a sure and authentic reference text for preparing local catechisms. Catechesis will find in this genuine, systematic presentation of the faith and of Catholic doctrine a totally reliable way to present, with renewed fervor, each and every part of the Christian message to the people of our time. This text will provide every catechist with sound help for communicating the one, perennial deposit of faith within the local church, while seeking, with the help of the Holy Spirit, to link the wondrous unity of the Christian mystery with the varied needs and conditions of those to whom this message is addressed. All catechetical activity will be able to experience a new, widespread impetus among the people of God, if it can properly use and appreciate this post-conciliar catechism. All this seems even more important today with the approach of the third millennium. For an extraordinary commitment to evangelization is urgently needed so that everyone can know and receive the gospel message and thus grow to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I therefore strongly urge my venerable brothers in the episcopate, for whom the catechism is primarily intended, to take the excellent opportunity afforded by the promulgation of this Latin edition to intensify their efforts to disseminate the text more widely and to ensure that it is well received as an outstanding gift for the communities entrusted to them, which will thus be able to rediscover the inexhaustible riches of the faith. Through the harmonious and complementary efforts of all the ranks of the people of God, may this catechism be known and shared by everyone so that the unity and faith whose supreme model and origin is found in the unity of the Trinity may be strengthened and extended to the ends of the earth. To Mary, Mother of Christ, whose assumption body and soul into heaven we celebrate today, I entrust these wishes so that they may be brought to fulfillment for the spiritual good of all humanity. From Castel Gandolfo, August 15, 1997, the 19th year of the Pontificate. John Paul II. Apostolic Constitution Fidei Depositum. On the publication of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Prepared following the Second Vatican Ecumenical Council. To my venerable brothers the Cardinals, to the Archbishops, bishops, priests, deacons and all the people of God. John Paul II, Bishop, Servant of the Servants of God, For Everlasting Memory Introduction Guarding the deposit of faith is the mission which the Lord has entrusted to His Church and which she fulfills in every age. The Second Vatican Ecumenical Council, which was opened 30 years ago by my predecessor Pope John XXIII, of happy memory, had as its intention and purpose to highlight the Church's apostolic and pastoral mission, and by making the truth of the Gospel shine forth, to lead all people to seek and receive Christ's love which surpasses all knowledge. 
The principal task entrusted to the Council by Pope John XXIII was to guard and present better the precious deposit of Christian doctrine in order to make it more accessible to the Christian faithful and to all people of goodwill. For this reason, the Council was not first of all to condemn the errors of the time, but above all to strive calmly to show the strength and beauty of the doctrine of the faith. Illumined by the light of this Council, the Pope said, the Church will become greater in spiritual riches and, gaining the strength of new energies therefrom, she will look to the future without fear. Our duty is to dedicate ourselves with an earnest will and without fear to that work which our era demands of us, thus pursuing the path which the Church has followed for twenty centuries. With the help of God, the Council Fathers in four years of work were able to produce a considerable collection of doctrinal statements and pastoral norms which were presented to the whole Church. There the pastors and Christian faithful find directives for that renewal of thought, action, practices and moral virtue, of joy and hope, which was the very purpose of the Council. After its conclusion the Council did not cease to inspire the Church's life. In 1985 I was able to assert, for me, then, who had the special grace of participating in it and actively collaborating in its development, Vatican II has always been, and especially during these years of my pontificate, the constant reference point of my every pastoral action, in the conscious commitment to implement its directives concretely and faithfully at the level of each church and the whole church. In this spirit, on January 25, 1985 I convoked an extraordinary assembly of the Synod of Bishops for the 20th anniversary of the close of the Council. The purpose of this assembly was to celebrate the graces and spiritual fruits of Vatican II, to study its teaching in greater depth in order the better to adhere to it and to promote knowledge and application of it. On that occasion the Synod Fathers stated, Very many have expressed the desire that a catechism or compendium of all Catholic doctrine regarding both faith and morals be composed, that it might be, as it were, a point of reference for the catechisms or compendiums that are prepared in various regions. The presentation of doctrine must be biblical and liturgical. It must be sound doctrine suited to the present life of Christians. After the Synod ended, I made this desire my own, considering it as fully responding to a real need both of the universal church and of the particular churches. For this reason we thank the Lord wholeheartedly on this day when we can offer the entire church this reference text entitled The Catechism of the Catholic Church, for a catechesis renewed at the living sources of the faith. Following the renewal of the liturgy and the new codification of the canon law of the Latin Church and that of the Oriental Catholic Churches, this catechism will make a very important contribution to that work of renewing the whole life of the Church, as desired and begun by the Second Vatican Council. The Process and Spirit of Drafting the Text The Catechism of the Catholic Church is the result of very extensive collaboration, it was prepared over six years of intense work done in a spirit of complete openness and fervent zeal. In 1986 I entrusted a commission of twelve cardinals and bishops, chaired by Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, with the task of preparing a draft of the catechism requested by the Synod Fathers. An editorial committee of seven diocesan bishops, experts in theology and catechesis, assisted the commission in its work. The Commission, charged with giving directives and with overseeing the course of the work attentively followed all the stages in editing the nine subsequent drafts. The Editorial Committee, for its part, assumed responsibility for writing the text, making the emendations requested by the Commission and examining the observations of numerous theologians, exegetes, and catechists, and above all, of the bishops of the whole world, in order to improve the text. The committee was a place of fruitful and enriching exchanges of opinion to ensure the unity and homogeneity of the text. The project was the object of extensive consultation among all Catholic bishops, their episcopal conferences or synods, and of theological and catechetical institutes. As a whole, it received a broadly favorable acceptance on the part of the episcopate. It can be said that this catechism is the result of the collaboration of the whole episcopate of the Catholic Church, who generously accepted my invitation to share responsibility for an enterprise which directly concerns the life of the Church. This response elicits in me a deep feeling of joy, because the harmony of so many voices truly expresses what could be called the symphony of the faith. The achievement of this catechism thus reflects the collegial nature of the episcopate, it testifies to the Church's Catholicity. Arrangement of the Material A catechism should faithfully and systematically present the teaching of sacred scripture, 
the living tradition of the Church and the authentic magisterium, as well as the spiritual heritage of the Fathers and the Church's saints, to allow for a better knowledge of the Christian mystery and for enlivening the faith of the people of God. It should take into account the doctrinal statements which down the centuries the Holy Spirit has intimated to His Church. It should also help illumine with the light of faith the new situations and problems which had not yet emerged in the past. The Catechism will thus contain the new and the old, because the faith is always the same yet the source of ever new light. To respond to this twofold demand, the Catechism of the Catholic Church on the one hand repeats the old, traditional order already followed by the Catechism of St. Pius V, arranging the material in four parts, the Creed, the Sacred Liturgy, with pride of place given to the sacraments, the Christian way of life, explained beginning with the Ten Commandments, and finally, Christian prayer. At the same time, however, the contents are often expressed in a new way in order to respond to the questions of our age. The four parts are related one to the other, the Christian mystery is the object of faith, first part, it is celebrated and communicated in liturgical actions, second part, it is present to enlighten and sustain the children of God in their actions, third part, it is the basis for our prayer, the privileged expression of which is the Our Father, and it represents the object of our supplication, our praise and our intercession, fourth part. The liturgy itself is prayer, the confession of faith finds its proper place in the celebration of worship. Grace, the fruit of the sacraments, is the irreplaceable condition for Christian living, just as participation in the Church's liturgy requires faith. If faith is not expressed in works, it is dead and cannot bear fruit unto eternal life. In reading the Catechism of the Catholic Church we can perceive the wondrous unity of the mystery of God, His saving will, as well as the central place of Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, sent by the Father, made man in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit, to be our Savior. Having died and risen, Christ is always present in His Church, especially in the sacraments. He is the source of our faith, the model of Christian conduct and the teacher of our prayer. The Doctrinal Value of the Text The Catechism of the Catholic Church which I approved 25th June last and the publication of which I today order by virtue of my apostolic authority, is a statement of the Church's faith and of Catholic doctrine, attested to or illumined by sacred scripture, apostolic tradition and the Church's magisterium. I declare it to be a valid and legitimate instrument for ecclesial communion and a sure norm for teaching the faith. May it serve the renewal to which the Holy Spirit ceaselessly calls the Church of God, the Body of Christ, on her pilgrimage to the undiminished light of the Kingdom. The approval and publication of the Catechism of the Catholic Church represents a service which the successor of Peter wishes to offer to the Holy Catholic Church, and to all the particular churches in peace and communion with the Apostolic See, the service, that is, of supporting and confirming the faith of all the Lord Jesus' disciples, as well as of strengthening the bonds of unity in the same Apostolic faith. Therefore, I ask the Church's pastors and the Christian faithful to receive this Catechism in a spirit of communion and to use it assiduously in fulfilling their mission of proclaiming the faith and calling people to the Gospel life. This Catechism is given to them that it may be a sure and authentic reference text for teaching Catholic doctrine and particularly for preparing local catechisms. It is also offered to all the faithful who wish to deepen their knowledge of the unfathomable riches of salvation. It is meant to support ecumenical efforts that are moved by the holy desire for the unity of all Christians, showing carefully the content and wondrous harmony of the Catholic faith. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, lastly, is offered to every individual who asks us to give an account of the hope that is in us and who wants to know what the Catholic Church believes. This Catechism is not intended to replace the local catechisms duly approved by the ecclesiastical authorities, the diocesan bishops and the episcopal conferences, especially if they have been approved by the Apostolic See. It is meant to encourage and assist in the writing of new local catechisms, which must take into account various situations and cultures, while carefully preserving the unity of faith and fidelity to Catholic doctrine. Conclusion At the conclusion of this document presenting the Catechism of the Catholic Church, I beseech the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of the Incarnate Word and Mother of the Church, to support with her powerful intercession the catechetical work of the entire Church on every level, at this time when she is called to a new effort of evangelization. 
May the light of the true faith free humanity from ignorance and slavery to sin in order to lead it to the only freedom worthy of the name, that of life in Jesus Christ under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, here below and in the kingdom of heaven, in the fullness of the blessed vision of God face to face. Given on 11th of October 1992, the 30th anniversary of the opening of the Second Vatican Ecumenical Council, in the 14th year of my pontificate. John Paul II